Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for first coming out to the Mariah Stackhouse Girls Invitational here at Stanford Golf Course, but also want to thank you for spending some time with us here this evening. As you all know, we have a very special guest with us here this afternoon for this tournament. Really excited to share some wisdom and knowledge with all of you, but just to quickly introduce the the friend that we're going to have up here with us today. Uh, Mariah Stackhouse was a former AJGA junior, just like the rest of you all in her AJGA days, had a super impressive career of four AJGA wins, a three-time Rolex Junior All-American, 2011 AJGA Player Representative, and was on the 2011 Ping Junior Solheim Cup team. In college, she was a four-time All-American, the 2015 National Champion, and then played on the Victorious 2014 uh, U.S. Curtis Cup team. Started her LPGA career in 2017 and has already had five top ten finishes. Uh, again, really, really honored to have you here with us. Really excited to have the girls get to know you a little bit better as well. But want to have a very special welcome to Mariah Stackhouse. Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? Had a good time with the junior am in the practice round today? All right, that's awesome to hear. So. First off, I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I want to start off with a huge thank you uh, to the AJGA and, and everybody that's been involved in making this uh, come true and, and, and giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. It means a lot to me uh, to be here with you all today um, to kind of uh, uh, host this event and, um, you know, really support uh, you all who are the next generation. So. I'll start off by saying that and, uh, and and going ahead and giving everybody a huge luck this week. I can't wait to see uh, how you all do. And uh, as you know, I've spent a lot of time on this golf course, so um, I hope it's a treat for you all and, and, and that you uh, rock it this weekend. So thank you um, for coming uh, this weekend. And um, I really want to make this mostly a Q&A. Um, so I'm not going to speak for too long because I really want to get the opportunity to take as many questions from you all as I can and make this important and, and impactful for you. But uh, I know a lot of you all are, you know, I think the ages here this week are 13 to 17, 18, uh, something like that. So uh, actually I actually had a question. Show of hands, is there anyone in the room who's already committed to college? All right, we got a few commits. Congratulations, everyone. Um, so a raise of hands for everybody who's still looking at where they want to go to school. So considering, all right, quite a lot of hands for that too. So for those of you who are already committed, you know, you're already on your way. I don't, uh, I don't have much to share about that part of your journey. You made the decision. Congratulations. But for those of you who are still looking, I just wanted to share a little bit about what that process was like for me and, and how I ultimately um, guided myself to the decision that I, uh, that I made. So. I'll share a story uh, that I shared a few times, and it's, it's pretty interesting. So there was a particular school that I wanted to go to since I was about 11 years old. I fell in love with that college. I fell in love with that program, and I knew that's where I wanted to go to school. One day when I was about 14, I was maybe a freshman in high school. My swing coach at the time, he asked me, he said, Mariah, where do you want to go to school? I told him that school. He said, that's great. Hope you get there, but I never want to hear you say that again. And I was taken aback, right? I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're young. You don't exactly know what's the best fit for you right now, but what you don't want is other coaches to think that you're already mentally committed to this school, and therefore they're not going to express interest in you. And that, that conversation right there encouraged me to open my mind. And in doing so, I went forward, and I no longer was so absolute when people asked me where I was interested in. And the effect that, that had on me was that I did open my mind. Um, and so as I was going through the process of looking at schools, considering, my parents uh, were like, okay, we're going to go out west and visit a couple schools. And I literally was like, no, I'm not going that far from home. <laughs> That's okay. We don't need to do this trip. And they're like, you don't have to commit, but I do want you to go and I want you to talk to these coaches and have the experience. Um, and... I spent 24 hours on the, the campus of the college that I committed to, and I realized this feels like home, and I know that I'll be happy here. And it was being able, it was being guided, you know, by my parents, by my coach to understand that at that age, I didn't know and that I needed to be open to those experiences, and I'm incredibly grateful to them. Uh, and I had a great four years um, uh, where I went to college. And so I say that to say, keep an open mind, and, uh, you know, I think there are a few great things to look for when you're, uh -oh. right, cool. there are a few great things to look 
form when you're considering school. Okay, I'm going to step back closer to the speaker. I'm going to stay in this little area right here, clearly. <laughs> um, I think a big thing uh, that I've learned from my experience on the team and then a few, uh, from a few schools that uh, buddies of mine went to, I think one of the biggest things that you want to talk to coaches about as you're doing this process is how do you choose your travel team? And what I mean by that is coaches have five travel slots. Are those picked through qualifying at school or does the coach have picks? And so I recommend talking to a coach and I like the idea of favoring programs that have at least four qualifying spots and maybe one coach's pick. Because what that does is it makes sure that you're being chosen, are given a fair shot at being chosen for the travel team um, based on your performance week in and week out at previous tournaments and on campus. A lot of coaches, I won't even say a lot of coaches, but there are a few who will handpick a significant number of people that go on the team. All right, you might have played better the past few weeks, but they chose somebody else because, I don't know, they just want to pick that person for the travel team. And now you're not given the best opportunity to perform and play your way into those events. So I think that's a really good way to keep the college experience competitive while you're out there. So that's one really big uh, gem and token that I'll give to you all is ask the coaches how they select the travel team. That really impacts your entire experience uh, as a college athlete. Um, and uh, yeah, and then other than that, like get to know the team, get to know the vibe, really talk to the girls at the schools you're going to. They'll tell you the truth about the program and how they feel. So uh, take advantage of those visits um, or, or phone calls, however that might look, and find out as much as you can about just the general life that's fostered on that team. Because um, that's your family for the entire uh, four years that you're at that school. And you want to you wanna enjoy that experience and you want to enjoy the people that you're around. Um, so that's the advice that I give to you all who are still considering. Um, and then for those of you who might be going in soon, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some nerves for that, right? It's an entirely different experience. And uh, I remember my flight, actually, to California. I was playing that summer, playing some AJGA events, and then I got on the plane. And I don't think it was until that very moment that I realized, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to college now. And I almost had a full-blown <laughs> panic attack on the plane because I started thinking, I'd already got my schedule, I'd got my practice schedule, workout schedule. I was like, how is this going to work? There's not enough time in the day for me to be able to do all of these things. And so I went in just really nervous about what that was going to look like and was I going to be able to perform both athletically and academically. And then what I found was it was actually, I think, yeah, we had a lot of time um, dedicated to all of those things, but when you're on a team, you have such a, a, a strict schedule that you actually end up being a bit more um, competent with time management than a lot of your peers might be because your schedule's kind of set out for you. And it makes that transition a lot smoother than you would ordinarily if your schedule was completely up to you and you had all that time in the day and you know no guidance necessarily. And so I found that I got to campus and I immediately had a family in my team. So you're wondering how it's going to shape up socially. That was easy off rip because I had them to start off with and I had that sense of belonging uh, and that sense of comfort with the golf team. And then, uh, you know, as you start, as I started playing, uh, I started going to class um, and making more friends, um, you know, just in the general uh, student body, I, I found that I was able to, to, to slide into that rhythm. Uh, pretty quickly and, and, and find my bearings. So for those of you who are a little bit nervous, don't be, um, you'll get it. And then when you don't, you know, call mom and dad and, and, and panic a little bit and I'm sure they'll be there to ground you <laughs> and tell you that you can do it. Um, but yeah, and uh, so those are two other things that I kind of wanted to talk to you about. Um, but then also, Raise your hand for those of you who are interested in playing on the LPGA after you're done with college. Anybody? Yeah. Um, I, if I'm going to be completely honest, I'd say if I could go back in time, would I do anything in terms of training and getting ready for the LPGA tour a little bit differently during my time in college? Um, and I would absolutely say yes. And I think the things that I would do differently are... I would focus a little bit more on the weekends and getting that extra practice in on my short game, specifically putting and chipping. I think we grow up, we play golf for all these years. Most of us are pretty competent, tee to green. And those are things that you just drill, you drill, you drill, and you get better at that. 
But what really I find that separates those people who are at the top um, on the LPGA tour, um, and I mean by that like top 30 on the money list, those are the ones who are eliminating those, um, those, those bogeys that you get from missing the green. They're getting up and down all the time, and those birdie conversion rates are really high. And I think college is a special time to be able to really work on that in somewhat more of a, of a, a low-pressure environment. You're still growing. You're still learning. You still have the team around you. You have people um, um, to bounce and, and really practice with and grind with. You're all working towards one similar goal. And um, I think take advantage of that opportunity to work with people who have the same goal as you versus, you know, figuring out once you get out there, okay, I mean, you know, I'm out here now, I'm living my dream, I'm on the professional tour, i got to make this happen quickly and I've got to make it happen now. And it's, that's definitely possible, but I think I could have, you know, come out even better prepared to take advantage for that opportunity. And so, um, you know, that's what I would say. Really, really, really focus in on that short game, practice while you're in college, and, um, you know, you're going to want to have fun, too. So I, I've talked a lot about school and, and juggling school and juggling classes, but absolutely be a college student, have that fun, and that's what makes it even more important to have that diligent practice schedule. Um, you know, because you deserve to, to go out with your friends sometimes. You deserve to go to those birthday dinners, right? You want to have a well-rounded experience. And, uh, you know, I think you can have all three of those things um, as long as you're, you know, diligent and, and, and honest with yourself and your time and, and structured. So that's what, uh, those are a bit of the, you know, keys that I might have focused in on a bit more while I was in school. But, um, you know, I, I had a great time and I think that, it definitely set me up and prepared me um, for, for a career on the LPGA, and, and I've been out here having a blast the last five years and wouldn't trade it for the world. So that's just a little bit about what I wanted to share with you all. And now I want to open the floor up to any questions anyone might have. Um, it can be about anything. It can be about junior golf. It can be about college golf. Um, it could be about school. Anything. Anything you want. Ask away. And can everybody say their name? Hi, um, my name is Jasmine Field. So I had a question about um, college and then moving on to like the next level. So I heard that you won the 2015 NCAA championship you were on the Curtis Cup team. You know, in my eyes, you're definitely good enough to move on and go on the LPGA in your collegiate like, years. So like, what made you stay? Like, obviously you're thinking about practicing for the LPGA Tour too. What made you stay at Stanford for all four years? What made me stay at Stanford? That's a great question, uh, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, for me, I've always been somebody, um, you know, ever since I was younger, I really love to learn. And I think past that, I've always enjoyed um, the relationships that I've built, not just on the golf course, but with my peers, both in high school and in college. And so what I found was a community of people who were driven um, all around me and that I built that family with, and we would have fun together. And so I was really happy with my experience as a student athlete. And as a result of that, I wasn't in a rush to get away from it. And, um, you know, for me, coming to Stanford, I really wanted to take advantage of that opportunity educationally. And so um, it meant a lot to me to get that degree, and that's why I stayed. And I also understood that the LPGA um, was going to be there for me, um, whether I turned pro early or turned pro after. And so I made that conscious decision to um, stay true to my values and, and, and what was important to me. And, and like I said, I was, I was having a blast. I was having a good time, so I wasn't in a rush to get away. But thank you for asking that. I'm Lily Zhang, and I was just wondering, how did playing in AJJs help you get to where you are here now? Yes. Uh, great question, Lily. Thank you. Um, you know, I actually uh, uh, talked a little bit about that earlier um, on, on, on an interview, but the AJGA is an incredibly, incredibly special tour. And, uh, you know, I think somebody, I think the question posed was, you know, what's the difference between the LPGA and the AJGA? And I said, one of the things that I've been uh, most intrigued at are not what's different, but what's the same. Um, you know, you have a junior am that you all often participate in. Well, a lot of us pros on tour, not everybody in the field every week, but a lot of us are 
playing uh, pro-ams every Wednesday. And so you're really prepared um, with how to engage in that format of golf. And when you're on the LPJ, it's incredibly important because these are the people who are spending uh, 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 and supporting the tour and eager to spend time with us professionals. And that's how we keep those relationships and keep our tour alive. And so the AJGA prepared me for how to, um, uh, um, you know, really entertain, you know, the people who are supporting this tour and supporting us. So, uh, you know, it's really cool uh, uh, to do that. And just in general, a lot of the events that the AJGA has, we have the we have some, should I just stand? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you have, uh, you know, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll even go away from the events. It's, you have your point system, right? You have your ranking and you're working to climb that. We have a very similar system out on tour. It's very, it, it, it teaches you how to be aware of where you are, looking at uh, uh, everybody at the top and knowing exactly where you stand and, and what needs to be done to climb that leaderboard, the system all year long, the awards at the end of the year given to the people who are performing high year in and year out, that's the same thing that we have on tour. So it really is, you know, it really is like a mini tour preparing you for how to, um, you know, handle a season long endeavor. And it's different, right? You're not playing every single week. But the fact of the matter is you start at the beginning of the year and these points are matriculating as you go, or these points are adding up as you go along and they're counting as you go through the season. What I really loved is that pressure, right? The, the, the pressure that put on me, it's the same here. On the LPGA, you know, we have goals of making the Solheim Cup team and, and, and these kind of lists. You all have the same thing, right? You're trying to make the Junior Solheim Cup team. Is it still uh, Wyndham? What, are you, the Wyndham Cup? Yeah. You still have the Wyndham yeah. Cup, right? So you have those types of teams that you're trying to make. You want to get on the Wyndham Cup. That's a benefit of performing well season uh, uh, throughout the season. I think there are so many things that the AJGA teaches you. It teaches you about traveling. Um, uh, uh, you know, across the country, different climates, time zone changes. You're going to do a lot of that as both a college athlete and a professional golfer. So what you don't realize is you're traveling around with your parents and, and, and it's easy right now, but it's really teaching you how to adapt very quickly in, in, in those circumstances, different types of grass, um, different types of courses. And uh, you're just learning how to how to study and, and adapt very quickly, and that is going to be incredibly beneficial to you in college and super beneficial to you um, on the LPGA when everything changes every single week. Hey, Mariah. My name is Kennedy Adams. And Kennedy. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having us out this week. Um, I know it's not possible without you, so it means a lot to us. Um, so, obviously, endorsements are a huge part in giving you the opportunity to play on the LPGA Tour with the expense of travel and um, with the purses not being huge as well. Um, so, what are some of the contributing factors that gave you the ability to be attractive to um, larger corporations and enable you to gain endorsements from them? Uh -huh. That is a, that's, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So I see you're already uh, doing your research about what it takes to be on the LPGA tour. Great, great. Um, yeah, endorsements are really huge, like you said, to be able to help you just with the expenses, caddy expenses, travel expenses, international expenses, those really start to add up. And I think the pressure of wanting to perform on tour itself, um, you know, that's what you're here for. It's the goal. And, and, and you want to figure out how to make that as, as you want to take as much stress about off of that as possible. And that's what sponsorships make possible. Um, I'm really fortunate to have a really great agent. He's sitting right over there. JSK takes good care of me. I got to shout you out, put you on the spot. Um, but, um, you know, that's, he's been incredibly helpful to me, uh, um, getting some of those sponsorships, but I also have friends who, um, are out on tour independently. And so, what a lot of them do um, to, uh, to build those relationships is, we talked about the junior ams that you all do. A lot of the times in our pro ams, you'll play with people who have companies. Um, obviously, if they're there, they're interested in women's golf. You make a great connection in that that pro am group. 
you might have found yourself a sponsor right there who just took a liking to you and is interested in supporting your journey on the LPGA tour. Um, I have a lot of friends who are not afraid to write uh, to, to companies that they're interested in representing and saying, hey, here I am. Um, this is my brand um, and, and, and this is what I believe in and I think that we would be a great fit um, uh, working together on tour. And so I think I'm going to harp on a word that I just said, brand. Um, I think you all especially live in a time where social media can be a huge benefit to you all in building a brand. And what I mean by that, it doesn't have to mean you have a lot of followers. Because um, I've actually found that, yes, that can sometimes make it easier for you to get sponsorships, but they're looking past that. So what are you putting out, you know, into the world? What does your content say about me? So, um, you know, what are you engaging in, etc. You all can really, really, really use that to your benefit, which I think is special. And it's a great way to market yourself that a lot of people in the past didn't necessarily have. So um, that's way to take advantage of that. And then just know what your strengths are. So if you're... A lot of corporate companies, um, you know, they like uh, college athletes who, you know, had a great college career but also enjoyed their academic experience, stayed four years. A lot of companies are like that. You go to a lot of kind of more athletic companies, they're looking more so at how did you compete in college? Did you win tournaments? Do I feel like um, this is going to be a great investment for me moving forward uh, an LPGA player? So that's what your athletic brands are looking for. Um, so it's really figuring out your niche, where you fall, and what you can offer that company. Um, but I think the biggest thing is um, people are really looking for an athlete that, one, works hard, um, two, is dedicated to their craft, and three, is somebody that's representing their brand with, with, with character, integrity, and happiness on the golf course, right? And um, I think those are things that you can kind of think about and promoting that really make you attractive to companies. Um, but it all depends on, like I said, corporate versus athletic versus, um, you know, it just depends on where, where you want to align yourself. But there's a lot of different ways you can go about that. Um, and the social media route, too. So it's all up to you. I, can't, I just can't do the social media. I've tried so much. I'm working on it. But I'm like, I don't know how you all post all the time. I post one post. And I'm like, all right, next month. <laughs> you know? Um, but I think you all are a bit more used to that. And that can be huge. Yeah. You're welcome. I'm Anna Ritter, um, and this is kind of more on your mental game, but have you ever felt burnt out, and what did you do to overcome it? Yes, yes. Um, have I ever felt burnt out? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I've necessarily felt burnt out before, but I think sometimes if you feel like golf's not going your way, you can get fatigued in your efforts, right? You know, um... I think as an ath as athletes, we work really hard and we want to see those results. And if we're not seeing them as quickly um, or as impactfully as we like, that's I think when the tie the wear and tear starts to to wear in. And it's like, okay, I want to see the fruit of my labor. You know, so how am I going to stay committed to the journey and how am I going to keep working even in the times where I'm not seeing that uh, as quickly as I would like? But I think a good way to um, Kind of attack that burnout is take a look at your schedule right so if you have a few weeks off um let's say three weeks in between a tournament you're at home for three weeks i don't think it's a bad thing to say hey i'm going to take these five days off right now and i'm going to sit and, and and i'm going to step away for a second i'm going to let myself miss the game i'm going to let myself really really want to be at practice and feel like all right i've got to get back out there a lot of the times your body needs a reset and you know, athletes, we're in go, go, go mode. You know, we know that we have to be working. We know that our competitors are working and we can't afford to slack off. But you have to honor uh, your body and your mind when it's telling you, okay, I need to step back. I need to recuperate. Um, but I think an important thing to do in those moments are not just necessarily take a step back and, 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 and 
completely throw it aside, but that's the time to step back and work on the mental game. Okay, let me reflect on my game. What have I been working on? What's holding me back? Uh, what could use a little tidying? And then work with, uh, I don't know, whoever your coach is, if it's your dad, if it's your coach, um, if you have a mental coach and say, hey, this is what's going on on the course. I'm feeling a little tired, but I think it's a result of this. And, get, and develop a plan so that once you step back to practice, you feel invigorated. You're like, all right, I have this plan. I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to work because that's what's going to make you feel good. And that's what's going to bring that enthusiasm back alive inside of you. Um, yeah, so, don't, I, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. Don't be afraid to take a break and kind of sink into yourself and, and figure out what you need um, to resharpen, refocus. And uh, as athletes, that's the hardest thing for us to do, but it's also one of the most important things for us to do. Uh, hi, my name is Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, I was just wondering what the hardest part about playing on the LPGA is. <laughs> hardest part? Um, it might be packing a suitcase <laughs> every week. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, actually not too much kidding that is that is a really difficult part is just living out of your bag um i think the hardest part about being on the lpga tour is you're traveling i mean there could be weeks where you travel four or five weeks in a row um you're living out of your suitcase and i think the biggest thing there is how do i stay energized how do i show up week five and still feel like it's week one and i have an effort to give uh for that last event and so what i found is i mean my rookie year was so tough for me because you don't know the courses and i was out there every it didn't matter how many weeks in a row i had to get there monday i had to play i had to play tuesday um and by the end of it, I was just really, really drained. And uh, so what I learned then is it's actually not important to be out there on the course every single day, those days leading up to the tournament. It's actually more important to spend your time studying the golf course. And that might mean playing nine on Monday, nine on Tuesday, nine on Wednesday. Um, taking your time, really studying, learning the course, um, uh, and then spending more time on the short game at the course and so I find that I spent so much time in the course that by the time I was done I wasn't spending as much time practicing because I'm spent and I've been out here for weeks now and I'm tired so now I focus on intentional studying of the golf course when I'm playing figuring out my strategy what clubs I'm going to hit um, you know stuff that you all know to do but being much more intentional about that and being aware of the fact that I still have Thursday to Sunday that I'm going to play and I need to be at full peak and full capacity those four days um, so how do I manage myself and actually put in the work, um, you know, whether that's something that I need to tweak in my swing, whether that's something that showed up in my putting, I need to drill in or out over these next three days to get ready for the next event, how to do that smartly. Um, and I think that's the biggest difference. And I actually had a couple vets that, that I got to be pretty cool with rookie year who said that. I just couldn't listen then. I just felt like I needed to know the golf course, but they were absolutely right. And I wish I'd heeded that a little bit then um, and, and not fatigued myself as much. And, you know, that, that, you know, there were some events where, you know, I knew I was playing well, but I just couldn't keep that steam because I was tired. Um, and so that's, a, that's something that I've learned now and definitely taken advantage of. And I feel like I can go weeks and weeks and weeks now on tour and feel just fine. Um, so that was huge. Uh, that was, that was a, a big learning point for me. Um, but yeah, it's just figuring out how to play smart out there. And it's, it's hard when you start, but you figure it out. Yes, um, my warm-up routine, uh, controlling nerves and mindset. So uh, one thing I want to say about nerves is nerves are your friend. Um, nerves show up when you have an opportunity and nerves show up when you care. Um, so that's always something to lean into. Um, and, and so I relate nerves to opportunity and that means there's something for me to get out here and grab and let's be excited about that. Um, so that's kind of how I talked myself through nerves um, and, 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 and reinforced the fact that they're a good thing.
uh, uh, to experience. As far as warm-up routine, um, that can be something that you also use to temper it as well. Having a, a, a routine that you go through every single time before every single tournament, consistency relaxes us and it gives us something to fall back on and feel confident in. And so my routine, um, I start off with the range um, and actually I'll go back I start off with now, I never used to have to do that, that I had to do it the last two years, is I found that I used to be able to show up to the range and get going, and all of a sudden I need to stretch. So you all are a long way from that point, <laughs> but it might be coming soon, you never know. Um, so I do actually a 30 minute uh, stretch, glute and core activation before I go out to the range. Um, so I get to the course 30 minutes early to do that uh, in our locker room, and then I go to the range and I hit seven balls with every other club, um, and I just work my way up through the bag uh, with that. And I might, let's say, work on a couple draws, or I might have a swing uh, thought in, in, in place, but really I'm just trying to loosen up. And a lot of players that work on something intentional on the range, I like to be free. Um, the lowest round of golf that I actually ever shot uh, I was late to the tournament. This was in college. I was late to the tournament, panicked. I was like, oh man, uh, I'm going to be in trouble for this. And I had like time to hit three balls, um, roll two putts, and had to go straight out to the course, shot the best round of my life. And so that really taught me that a warm up is, is it's not about, it's not a practice. It's, it's a loosening of the body. And all we want is to feel like, all right, we're loose, we're ready to go play. Um, so I try to approach it that way on the range. Um, so if I'm hitting it great, I'm going to say, yeah, you know, this is great. I'm going to go stripe it today. But even if I'm not hitting it that great, I'm, say, I'm just loosening up and I'll get out. Great. That's always my approach um, to the range. And then I'll go chip a little bit and I just chip around. I try to always put it in the rough in the toughest positions and see a couple good chips. And, and actually, I like to try to focus on my chipping, chipping one in the hole. Um, so I'll give myself a couple short ones maybe so that I can see that. Um, you like the sound of that, that intention. And uh, so like I might choose maybe a eight yard downhill chip shot. Try to chip one of those into the hole. You do that a couple of times. That just really sets you off. All right, I'm chipping well. I've chipped one in. You feel good now. Um, and then I do the same thing with my putting. And uh, putting is actually the only part of my routine that might change um, every now and then. And what I mean by that is sometimes we're putting great and we're in a rhythm. But it's one of those things where if you feel like it's gotten a little bit off, I'll adjust something for putting really quick and give me a drill that makes me feel confident again. Um, and so that could be a couple of three footers, find a straight uphill three foot putt, knock those into the hole. Or if I feel like ah, I felt a little bit off in my tempo, I'll find something to stabilize my arms um, and, and, and get those shoulders back engaged. Just one simple thing with putting to make me feel like, all right, that stroke is solid. I'm hitting it in the hole. So I guess what I'm saying is there's you can do that a few different ways um, but it's all about finding a routine that makes you feel like all right I'm ready to go play golf and uh, your mind and what you're seeing is the only thing that matters for your game it's not uh, what your caddy might see it's not you know necessarily what your coach and you were seeing a couple days ago that moment on that tee that morning you have to feel good because you're the one hitting the shots and what's going to get you to that place My one of my favorite memories playing in AJGA. I have so many. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I still have some buddies out on tour um, uh, now, and we'll still reminisce on our AJGA days. But uh, this, this uh, where were we playing? Um, it's a it's a it's an invitational, open invitational that's over Thanksgiving. Um, no. You see Polo, but that's the Rolex. Where is it hosted now? PGA National. PGA National. And there's, yeah, that's where the bear, the bear is out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so I won't name any names, actually. But one of my favorite memories is just a group of us um, going and, and somebody decided they wanted to, like, climb up the bear and be silly. And, and that turned into, like, a <laughs> catastrophe. And, of course, we got pictures and, and memories of that. But it's, it's those, uh, it's those. 
<laughs> I wish I could tell y'all who it is or she killed me. Um, <laughs> but uh, those are the kind of memories that I that I think back on with AJGA and and just really having fun with all my buddies and enjoying those experiences. And you'll remember them forever. And uh, the bonds that you build here, actually, those are the friends that once you go through college and you get on tour, I mean, you're really, really close with because you knew each other, you know, back at a time where, you know, you were playing, yes, super competitive, but this was also a really fun environment and you built those genuine friendships and you know each other from childhood on uh, into the adult world. So um, those are those are the memories that I love uh, at AJGA events. <laughs> All right, let's do one more question. Yeah. Four. I don't even need a mic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so while your essay is Um, forcing and studying myself. <sighs> Gosh, sometimes I remember like getting through a quarter and, and being like, wow, I did that. How? <laughs> um, but every college athlete uh, uh, can agree with, with that. It's, um, you know, I think what I, I felt finally learned to do kind of into my sophomore year was look at my um, syllabi ahead of time and actually know what was coming. And that way, if there were, let's say, any papers or midterms due around tournaments and things like that, I would know, okay, I'd set a reminder on my phone or I'd set something in my calendar and say, okay, we got a tournament coming up, you've got this midterm, we need to take care of these things ahead of the tournament so that I can be focused on the golf um, and, and performing my best at this event. Um, and then, uh, you know, everybody's team uh, has different schedules, but we would work out in the mornings. Um, and so I actually, that actually forced me to really stay on top of everything because, I mean, if we have to be in the gym at 6 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that means on those nights I got to be in the bed at a reasonable hour to be able to get up and perform in the gym. So then I wasn't dilly-dallying in the afternoons. Um, I was getting my work done. I was getting my studying done, and that kind of kept me on a tight schedule. Um, but, I mean, it, I mean, you just kind of... You go with it, it changes every semester, every quarter, uh, based on the classes that you're taking, the workload and, 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 and travel season. And all of your coaches will tell you to take your lightest load in the spring because, I mean, we're on the road almost every other week, sometimes a couple weekends in a row. So they'll make sure that you have the appropriate course load for our hardest travel schedules. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I finally learned that you actually have to take a look at the syllabus <laughs> ahead of time so that nothing comes surprising you um, at, an, at, at bad moments. And, um, you know, freshman year is trial and error. <laughs> and after that, you figure it out. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here. <laughs> And good luck to everyone. Can't wait to see who comes out on top. <laughs>